being in Tacoma. Some are probably there with Brother Wesley Leonard. Some will be going down this afternoon. We pray for the success of that effort. Uh, in John, the uh, 19th chapter, uh, our text begins at verse 25, where um, we read of the crucifixion of Jesus. And the Bible says, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciples, Disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. I want to speak from the subject, the suffering servants shout. The suffering servants shout. Today, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to take you back to Calvary. Is that all right? Calvary, where we see man at his worst, but we see God at his best. Calvary, where we see the depths of human sin but we also see the tremendous height of divine love. Calvary, where the Lamb of God was slain and where the Son of God gave up his life for you and for me. Calvary, where every man must come if he expects to be saved. Calvary, where all of our hopes are centered both for this world and the next. The hymnist Sir Isaac Watts made such a visit and sought to describe the response when he said through this song, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but lost and poor contempt on all my pride. He wrote, forbid it Lord that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, he wrote, I sacrifice them to his blood. You know the song where he said, see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose so rich a crown. And as he contemplated the extent of Christ's humiliation and the greatness of God's love for sinners, he responded by saying, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. That's a beautiful song. Jesus uttered some phrases as he died to reveal God's love and determination to save sinners from sin. You remember this phrase when he spoke a word of forgiveness when he said, Father, forgive them. You know the rest. For they know not what they do. He then spoke a word of salvation when he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43. He spoke a word of affection from the cross when he said, Woman, behold thy son. Behold thy mother. He spoke a word of anguish when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He spoke a word of suffering when he said, I thirst. And then he spoke a word of victory when he said, it is finished. 
And he spoke a word of contentment when he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And before his last words, the suffering Savior gave a voice or a shout of triumph when he said, It is finished. And in these words are contained in one word in the original language. While the sentence is brief in length, it is immeasurable in its significance that this was not the last cry of a helpless man. I'm going to preach this lesson. It was the completion of a mission. You remember at the tender age of 12 years old, Jesus revealed an awareness of his unique mission in the service of God when he said to Mary and Joseph when they found him in the temple taking the doctors and lawyers to school, he said, how is it that you sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business. And in his high priestly prayer uh, preceding the crucifixion, the Savior prayed in anticipation of what he was about to accomplish on the cross when he said, I have glorified thee on earth and I have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. A few moments before he was to commit his spirit into the hands of God, we hear Jesus rejoicing over the completion of the work for which his father sent him into the world to do. And if we could just spend a moment of time to, to begin to lift the veil and view in detail what the Savior actually finished, we could leave here more aware and more committed in the service of God. It is finished. Meant that all the prophecies connected with his life and death had been fulfilled. When we think of Isaiah, we think of Isaiah primarily as the prophet who foretold the birth of the Savior in Isaiah 7. When we think of the prophet Micah, we think of him as prophesying the place of his birth in Micah 5 and verse number 2. When we think of the suffering Savior and his prophecies, we, 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 we think of him, uh, of the inspired psalmist in Psalm 22 and uh, uh, 1 through 31, hundreds of years before Christ uh, had one nail pierce his flesh. Uh, David, while he was going through his own stuff, David was going through his own trial and at the same time gave an accurate description of the suffering Messiah who would quote the same words that David wrote when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And during the last six months of Jesus' ministry, he concentrated his teaching uh, on his apostles in Matthew 16, 21, Jesus predicts his death for the first time. For the phrase in that scripture when he said, from that time on, marked a turning point and it signaled Jesus' announcement of the kingdom of heaven. And it points to his new emphasis on his death and resurrection. It is finished. Meant that Christ's sacrificial work of redemption was completed. For we are not saved from the penalty of sin by the remarkable life that Jesus lived. As important as that perfected life was, uh -huh, the implications thereby allowing him to be the lamb without spot or blemish. We are not saved from the penalty of sin by just the teachings that fell from Jesus' lips. As excellent as they were uh, and as relevant as we should make them for living, we obtain our salvation through Jesus Christ by the virtue of the fact that he died in our place. First, he met the demands of God's holy law with a perfect life. That in no instance had he broken the law of God. Now, uh, 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 in, in their mind, uh, nobody could say uh, that they have done no wrong. Amen. But if you did, I know that you have a problem somewhere, and that's telling the truth. Uh, uh, for all have sinned. Is that right? Not y'all have sinned, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Second, he met the demands of, of the law of God by dying as a substitute for sinners. That by his death, he redeemed us from the curse 
of the law. I want to spend just a moment here to deal with this point. For he who knew no sin became sin that we who were in sin might be made free from sin. That's a sacrifice. And that the cross that you and I wear around our necks is not a symbol of righteousness. The cross is a symbol of that upon which Christ, who became sin, was nailed. The moment Christ was lifted up, he was lifted up. We know he was the Lamb of God. But when he was lifted up, he was not lifted up as the Lamb, but as the serpent. Watch this. I didn't say this. The Bible says it. In John 3, 13, the Bible said, And no man has ascended up into heaven, but that, that he came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses, are you with me? As Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believe in him might not perish, but have what? Everlasting or eternal life. Now I know we know the next part because if you've been in the Church of Christ a little while, uh, I know you know the next one and you can quote that with me for God so loved the world. If you don't know that, uh, he gave his own life. Isn't that right? Uh, that uh, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever what? Believe in him might not perish but have everlasting life. You need to know that scripture. But everybody in the church knows John 3, 16. And if you're a new convert and you don't know any scriptures, that's a good one to start with. Amen, somebody. In John uh, 12, 23, Jesus, the Bible said, Jesus answering them saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now in John 12 verse 24, drop down uh, to verse 24 when he said, Verily, verily, do you see that? Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn uh, of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it what? If it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. The words verily, verily, or surely, surely, or certainly, certainly, or check it out. Jesus is saying, now I'm getting ready to unlock the mystery or the purpose in my coming to earth. I didn't really come here to walk on water. I did that, but that's not really why I came. I didn't come here just to heal the sick or raise the dead. I did that, but I didn't come here just for that. I didn't come to make somebody's wedding turn out all right. I did that, but that's not really why I came. I did not come just to heal the woman with the issue of blood. I did that, but that's not really why I came. I did not come so that I could heal blind Bartimaeus so that in a few years blind Bartimaeus could die. I did that, but that's not the purpose for my coming. I did not come to raise Lazarus from the dead. I did it, but I knew Lazarus was going to die a few years later anyway. I did that, but that's not why I came here. I came in order that I might die. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides by itself. You can go to the grocery store and buy a bag of seeds. And as long as you keep the seeds on the shelf, it won't do anything. But when you bury it in the ground, it'll begin to fulfill the purpose of the seed. Are you with me? Christ said, I didn't come to be left on somebody's shelf. I came to die, be buried, and when I'm buried, that's where the glory will come from my story. Ah, uh, don't make me repeat it this morning. 
If the grain of wheat does not get planted, it just remains as one seed. But if it die, it will produce and multiply to produce much more. The Bible says in John 12, 25, he that loveth his life shall lose it. But he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. He said, in other words, you can't be a Christian and be afraid to die. In other words, if you've signed up for the Christian Jubilee, you can't be a Christian and be afraid to go through something. Am I right about it? And be afraid to die. That the most life-giving experiences, watch this, as a Christian, will come through death experiences. And the more you go through death experiences, the more you will experience life experiences. And if nothing in you never dies, then you'll never really say you lived. Uh-huh, you start praying for abundant life, but we really ought to start praying for abundant death. For the more you die in one area, I've come to find out that the more you live in another area. That's why you often feel so strange in this life in which we live. Because on the one hand, it's the best of times, but then on the other hand, it can be the worst of times all at the same time. How in the world can it be the best of times on one hand, and then the worst of times on another hand, all at the same time. You can be going through death experiences and life experiences at the same time. So the more stuff you go through, the more you live in another area. For the more something dies, the more it lives. You've been asking God to give you abundant life. And it seems like everything around you is starting to die. Well, God is answering your prayers. Hmm. It seems odd, don't it? That I've asked God to give me abundant life, but yet everything around me is falling apart. And God is saying, yeah, that's right where I want you, because now I'm answering your prayers. That you're going to have to die in some areas in order to live in others. So we ought to die to our will, die to our attitude, die to our disposition, and the more it dies, the more you release the glory. Isn't that all right? And the more God, the more glory God is going to get out of your life. Your dependence on people has to die. Your need for recognition, it has to die. Your need for acceptance, it has to die. And the more it dies, the more God is going to be glorified in your life. For the closer you get to the glorification, the more you're going to be crucified. Isn't that all right? And the more you're crucified, the closer you're getting. Am I right about it? Uh-huh. I'm just going to preach this lesson anyhow. Just don't stay on the cross. At some point, you got to get off of it. For you're going to live. You're going to get up again. You're going to see things differently. You're going to see things from a heavenly perspective. For to die is gain. That you may gain a new perspective and a new attitude on Christian living. Jesus said in John 12, in verse 27, My soul, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, Save me from this hour, but for this cause I came unto this hour. This is the real reason Jesus said I came. Jesus did not come here because he liked Barnes or three wise men giving him gifts. Whatever they brought to him, Jesus already owned it. For whatever you give God, God's already got it. He's full and lacking nothing. He owns everything. Jesus was born to die and everything he did was leading up to the moment when he would be able to say, it is finished. So then the cross was a conflict between good and evil. It's spiritual warfare at its best. And Christ did it with excellence. 
he put the devil in his place. He said, and I, if I be lifted up, he said, I'll draw all men unto me. And that ties into another scripture in John 3. So as the serpent was lifted up in the desert. Is that right? Now Jesus says, if I be lifted up from the earth, what he will do. He said, I'll draw all men, that's a magnetic attraction, unto me. Is that right? I will get, I will get more being lifted up from the earth than I did walking around, healing the sick, raising the dead, walking on water, and multiplying fish and bread. That my worst hour will actually turn out to be my finest hour. For in the being lifted up, I will then what? Draw all men unto me. It's going to look bad while I'm on the cross, but it's going to be all right. Folk are going to laugh while I'm hanging on the cross, but that's going to be my finest hour. They're going to spit on me and pull my beard out of my face, cast lots from my clothes. I'm going to look like I'm being humiliated and I'm going to be tortured. But if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Ah, now go back with me. You remember in the wilderness that the cure for snake bite was the brazen serpent that was beaten of brass and then lifted up. A symbol of the very thing that hurt them would be that which would turn around and heal them. Isn't that right? For just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Christ was lifted up on the cross for our healing. At last indeed, y'all don't mind if I quote the song, my Savior bleed. Indeed, my sovereign died. Would he devote his sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received what? My sight. And now I am happy all the day they had been bitten in the wilderness by the same thing that would turn around and heal them when it came to redemption Christ became the very thing that caused us the problem that we have the right to the tree of life was made able through the death of the son who was nailed uh -huh, on the cross for our sins it is finished means that the power of the evil one was destroyed. So the entire Bible, Holgate, is a record of God's conflict uh -huh, with evil and its continuous effort to deliver people from the penalty and the power of sin. And the first hint or prophecy of this conflict happened over in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. You remember uh, when the Bible says that he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed are you with me it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel when the scripture talks about the enmity he's talking about the hostility between the woman and the serpent that the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent it's a prophecy about Christ bruising the head of the enemy. That's a prophecy that goes all the way to the cross. For the seed of the woman and the seed of the enemy is a divine drama that plays out on Calvary. Because from the very beginning, God had the plan already in his mind. Isn't that right? It wasn't like Satan did something and then God said, oh, what am I going to do? Because Satan has done something, I need to go and do something. No, no, no. God had it already figured out. Isn't that all right? It was already in his plans. 
it was already in his agenda it was already in God's strategy it was a plan so strong that Ephesians 1 and verse number 4 talked about that plan that God had he said the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world it was already settled in eternity so what we're trying to say is is that when things happen God's got it already it's already worked out is that alright when you're going through something and you're wondering what you're gonna do it's already God already got it worked out it's already worked out in eternity just needs to show up in time y'all y'all you, you, you hear me this morning that 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 that, that nothing phases God he's not surprised by anything you can't catch God off guard he's already got it figured out he said the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world God already knew what God was going to do and all time does is reveal what God has already determined in eternity that's what time does so all prophecies all prophecies are is a prophesying in time what is already finished in eternity when they came to Jesse's house you remember they were looking for a king and Samuel anointed David to be king in reality David was just a shepherd boy but he was anointed in that eye and in the mind of the prophet he was already a king it was only a matter of time before his kingship occurred in time but it was already settled in eternity I'm a priest's lesson that the Christian still has to deal with the tempter and we can have complete victory over him through faith in Jesus Christ the resurrected affirm a resurrection affirm Satan's defeat and the second coming of Jesus will demonstrate it forever and the Bible then is a record of God's continued efforts to call people to lives of faith and obedience that will make it possible for them to re-enter the paradise of God for they were kicked out of one paradise and God has been trying to get us back ever since so that we can live with him in heaven forever Jesus died then to to remove that which separated us from the Creator and there is absolutely nothing to prevent people from having fellowship with God other than their sins in the present and spending eternity with God in the future if they will receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Redeemer you can go to heaven if you want to amen somebody and you can be lost if you want to and God does not coerce our faith our love our obedience God in his grace provides salvation for us and Jesus came to this last moment of earthly life he cried out it is finished and his death would have been in vain if you neglect or refuse to trust him as your Savior and if you want to go to heaven it's our responsibility not God's Jesus did his work it is finished does not mean I am defeated it is finished means that the work that you gave me is finished amen and so you know you know we we, we preach sermons every week we give the plan of salvation I'll give it again but at some point a person outside of Christ must come to the recognition I need the Lord I tried everything else in the world and it hadn't worked out 
I've been here, I've done that, I've traveled here, I've done that, I've had money, had no money, and yet and still, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And I drop by today to tell you that what you need is available in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John 1, 11 and 12, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And notice that our faith, our faith is not based on some mysterious experience. Verse 11 and 12 of John 1 said, He came into his own, and, and they that were his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave right to be come the children of God. And when a person believes in Jesus, he has the right then to become a child of God. But mentally believing the fact that Jesus is the Son of God does not make one a Christian. Are you with me? For we read, nevertheless, even the rulers, many believed on him. I'm talking about those who ruled during Jesus' day. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, lest they be put out of the synagogue. For the Bible said they love the glory of men more than the glory that is of God. So belief does not equate salvation. But one who believes is on the right road. He's on the right road. Amen? And so, so God commands then a change of habit that provides uh, a change of thought, providing a change of habit and ways. And repentance then is a change of mind that is brought about by the recognition of sin. That's a godly sorrow, repentance. I'm sorry, Lord. You know, it's not that fact that I, somebody caught me. It's the fact that, that, you know, I know what it does to you when I sin. That our sin bring God's, brings God's sorrow because of the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. And so the, 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 the goodness of God uh, and the fear of the Lord, these all result in the change of life, Matthew 3, 8. And then one must confess Jesus, and you'll confess him before this audience here. And you're standing, you're sitting in the midst of an audience that's pulling for you. Amen? We're, we're, we're pulling for somebody to be saved this morning. We're, we're rooting for somebody to come out of the world and come into Christ. Amen? Because we understand that it wasn't that long ago that we too were in the same situation. And but for the grace of God, amen somebody, we're still here this morning. And the Bible says that confession is made unto salvation. So once you confess, that doesn't even mean that you become a child of God, but you're still on the right road. Is made, you're a little closer, isn't that right? Unto salvation. Be baptized then for the remission of your sins. Most preachers today teach that baptism is not essential to salvation. Most preachers in the world don't teach that baptism is essential to salvation. It's as if they were saying, he that believeth and is not baptized shall be saved. Most people, most preachers don't preach that baptism is essential to salvation. But in the church of Christ we do. And that's what the devil told Eve. The, uh, Eve said, Eve said uh, uh, we, we can't eat of that fruit in the tree, midst of the garden for we'll die. And the devil said, no you won't. And ever since then the devil's been saying to God's yes, the devil has been saying no. And to God's no, the devil has been saying yes. Whatever God has said, the devil said, that, that's, that's not what it means. But the Bible is right. Am I right about it? And so, uh, one word, not, changes the whole meaning. Baptism is entrance into spiritual life. Mark 16, 15 and 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. 
And maybe you're here and you've been trying, you've been trying to make it on your own strength. And in doing so, you've canceled out the flow of God's grace in your life. And you're quenching, you're quenching the possibility of a relationship with God. Maybe you're here, you're already in Christ and you're trying to work things out on your own strength. You're trying to, you're trying to figure it out on your own. Let me explain it in a concrete example and I'm closing. If, if your refrigerator is not working, your food uh, will begin to spoil. And so you may go online, you know, you can go online for everything nowadays. You may go online and, and research how to fix a refrigerator. You'll find some information uh, about that. And you'll find a manual online for your model and it will show you all of the parts for your refrigerator. And so you spend time studying and researching the manual and you read the book thoroughly. And as you do, you attempt to apply what you learn. You twist this and you start turning that and start doing this and doing that. You move that and adjust that. No matter how much you apply from the instructions, nothing seems to be working. And all you've done is frustrate yourself trying to figure out how to fix a refrigerator that's broken and in the meantime your food is going bad are you with me you studied the book you examined the book you may even remember some of what the book says and you want your refrigerator to work you've gotten down on your hands and knees to tighten things up You've done this for hours, and finally, after all you've done, somebody comes up to you and has a suggestion, and why don't you just plug the refrigerator in? Just plug it in. And no matter how hard you try, and no matter how hard you work, you will only have wasted your time and your life if you do not get connected to the power of the cross in Jesus Christ. You have to plug into Jesus. You can go to church every single day of the week. You can buy the biggest, baddest Bible down at the Christian bookstore, spend $150 on a brand new Bible and read it from cover to cover, memorize scripture after scripture. You can study it. You can repeat it. You can tell others about it. In fact, you can try and do what it says all day long. But if you canceled out the flow of God's grace in your life to nullifying the cross and your relationship with Jesus, it won't mean a thing. You've got to plug your life into Jesus Christ. And many Christians are blocking what God wants to do in them and through them because they're trying to do it in their own strength instead of trusting God and plugging into the power source. Doing the best that you can and trying harder and working harder every day is not what God wants from you. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. He wants you. Amen, somebody. Or maybe if I do this and do that and do that and do that, ah, that, no, he wants you. He wants you. And that would mean he wants a real relationship with you. Amen, church. And he wants, what he wants for you to have is yours by virtue of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. I'm closing. Question, are you living beneath your dignity? Are you living beneath your privilege? Are you barely surviving under the circumstances? Today, take the time to stay plugged in to the power source and get on top of the circumstances instead of living beneath the circumstances. Maybe someone is here today and you're ready to accept Christ. You're ready to answer the question, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And you're willing to go down into the watery liquid tomb of baptism to have all your sins washed away. You can do that today, and we're rooting for you. 
and maybe you're here and you recognize I haven't been plugged into the power source and today I'm going to take the time to do what I need to do in order that I may have a real relationship with the Lord